So a little bit more on Dave. Back in 1994, 18 years before Spotify, he, found, <laughs> he started a company called Launch Music. It was later acquired by Yahoo in 2001, went on to be the, the internet's largest music site. He left Yahoo in 2006. 2007, yeah. 2007 was an EIR benchmark, and then came across SurveyMonkey. Yeah. So as someone who has been a founding CEO, an EIR, and then sort of, you know, took a control interest in the company. Are CEOs, are they made or are they born? <laughs> uh, well, first of all, I, before I forget, I just want to thank the last speaker for the plug for surveys uh, <laughs> at the end there. Very important. Hope all of you have SurveyMonkey accounts. If not, you know, I'll be you know signing you up in the back. Um, look, I think um, I think it's both. I think there's no way to um, learn to be a CEO without being one, right? <laughs> so for me, when I was 26 years old, um, I decided I want to start a company, not because I was a born entrepreneur, probably a lot more of you have sort of been that way. Um, had, you know, I didn't have the lemonade stand when I was 10 or whatever. I, I just, I'd gotten to the point where I just knew I needed to try running something I'm not very good at working for people. Um, and uh, no one was going to let me run anything at 26. So I decided I needed to start something in order to run it. Um, so I didn't know if I was going to be any good at it. And you know, frankly, I wasn't that good at it. Uh, it took me a long time to learn. Um, so I, I think there are some intrinsic qualities that like, are helpful to people. But I've seen lots of people be very successful with lots of different patterns of of being a CEO and lots of people who you think, wow, this person has kind of all the things kind of fail miserably. So um, I think there's, um, but there's nothing, nothing better than experience to figure it out. I, you know, I wish you could go to school and learn to be a successful CEO or entrepreneur, but the only way to do, learn is to do it. And, and then after you've sort of kind of gotten through one stage of it, you think, oh, I figured that out. But the next stage is completely different. I mean, I, I, I was terrible at financing in my first company. Now, like, it's been really easy. But, uh, you know, it's, and, it, 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 and, and, and speaking of financing, I yeah. should have asked you, uh, you recently did a pretty big round. <laughs> yes. <laughs> uh, an $800 million raise? Yeah, um, <laughs> it's not. <laughs> I don't want to put you on the no, spot. No, 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 it's fine. <laughs> it's, um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's it very different. SurveyMonkey is a very different kind of business. Um, uh, my first business was your more typical startup. It wasn't profitable for a long time. But uh, SurveyMonkey was profitable when I joined about four years ago, and we bought control from the founder. So it was a buyout deal. And the business was, you know, 90% EBITDA margins um, and, uh, you know, 12 people in Portland, Oregon. And so we, we've now, I like to joke, I've, my main contribution is destroying the margins. Um, uh, but we've built out a team and those sort of things. But we've got a very big scale business, and we've announced kind of our, our revenue and profit. We did $113 million in revenue last year and $61 million in EBITDA. And so when you have a business like that, you can raise a lot of capital. And what we did with this capital was make a decision that we don't necessarily want to go public um, just for, to create liquidity. And so we basically, it was all secondary. All that $800 million is going out the door to existing investors and employees. Um, and it's a, it's a nice way to get people cash without having to take the company public. Yeah. It, how, how, does some, how do you manage sort of a cultural shift after something like that? You, you've seen it before when you brought, brought the launch team into Yahoo. How do you keep people sort of motivated once they've begun to feel some liquidity. Yeah, I mean, I so I took my first company. We we actually went public in early '99 um, uh, before things got really crazy because we actually had a lot of revenue back then for a company going public. We had like eight million in revenue. Um, uh, I, I don't recommend that. I'm just I mean, that's what that was, but that was a lot. There were companies going public with no revenue. Um, uh, and then we sold the company Yahoo two and a half years later. Um, I, I think, and then what we're doing now, I think the first thing is, it's actually on the front end, it's on hiring. It's actually hire the right people in the first place, and you're going to be able to keep those people motivated. I think it's really, you want people to value the equity, that, that is absolutely important, but you don't want to hire people who are just coming 
for the equity. You don't want to get people who are like, okay, this is my lottery ticket. That, those are not the people that are going to be successful for you. They're going to be a problem in your culture because invariably there are bumps along the way. It's not all up and to the right. It's not all going to work out. And those people will be a problem. And those people will not only be the first to leave when there is liquidity, but they're the problems before you even get there. And so I think it starts at the front end is like hiring people who um, believe in the mission, believe in the culture, believe in what you're doing, and the liquidity is a side benefit. Um, and you, you know, I'm really excited. Um, actually, today our employees are getting the the, the payout from, from the, the financing that we did. And I'm really excited about it, but it just hasn't been that big a deal. Yeah. It like is not, it's not like changing things. We don't have people leaving. I don't expect to see, you know, uh, a bunch of Lamborghinis show up in the parking lot. Like it's just not, it's just because we hired people up front who that wasn't the critical factor. And, and what do you do in the hiring process to understand whether or not you found the right cultural fit? So, at launch, it was really like, wow, we're changing the music business. And so everybody was passionate about music and about changing the music business and disrupting it. With SurveyMonkey, it's different. Um, obviously, we're much more established business. We're profitable. And so it tends to be somewhat about mission, which is really helping people make better decisions, and somewhat about culture. And so we've been able to actually hire people who really like kind of that startup feel and environment, but also like the stability of a successful, profitable company, and we're willing to be more flexible with people's time, with their compensation, a whole bunch of things that it, you know, you, you couldn't necessarily do either at a big company or at a at a startup. And so we we're kind of able to thread the needle. And we've been really fortunate. We've been able to hire a lot of really talented senior women, um, which is you know, my head of um, uh, basically. Uh, I have two very senior people and then a, and a senior team, but um, Selena Tabakawala, who runs product engineering and product marketing for me, um, she's uh, incredibly talented. She could have been in the audience here running her own startup. She started Evite when she was in college at Stanford, um, and she's been very successful, and she ran product engineering for Ticketmaster. So she's a really successful executive, both in a startup and a big company. I was able to get her because she was four months pregnant, and she decided, she didn't really want to go do a startup. She'd been thinking about it. And I was able to convince her that like this was going to be a great fit. And it's sort of unusual to hire a, your, your head of product engineering when they're four months pregnant, particularly when we didn't have any engineers other than the two original ones. Um, <laughs> so it was a little, but, um, but I knew she was going to be great, and she's been fantastic. And so being flexible about stuff like that and saying, OK, yeah, this is the right person, and we can manage. Um, I muddled through um, for a while with, with her on maternity leave, and she's had two kids while she's been with us. So, you know, and we've done that with a bunch of other people. We've found accommodations. Our head of uh, UED, he had, his wife was about to have a baby, and he just like, he lives in the city, and he's like, I, I just, I can't be gone five days a week down in Palo Alto. So it's like, okay, you can work one day a week from home. Yeah. Like, we had 15 people. Yeah. I, I want to dig in a little bit more on the hiring, but I think this is probably a good time to point out. You leave work every day at 5.30. 5.45 sometimes, <laughs> but yes, yes. It, it, can, can you maybe sort of, <laughs> you know, it, I'm sure that's a surprise for a lot of people in the room. Can you maybe tell yeah. us uh, you know, how you, how you I, structure your day I or, didn't, or culturally? I didn't used to. So, and again, this kind of goes with the Survey Monkey sort of, um, you know, we have over 200 people now. Uh, four years ago, we had 12 people. Um, you know, I feel like, hey, we work hard, but we work smart, and it's not about FaceTime in the office. And the business was really successful with 12 people, so now that we have 200, people shouldn't be killing themselves, and it's a marathon, not a sprint. And so one of the best ways to give people that message is for me to leave um, on time. Now, in my first startup, that wasn't the case. My first startup, the first two years, I worked every single day, seven days a week, you know, probably, you know, 14 to 18 hours days um, and didn't take a day off. And um, that's just what I had to do. It wasn't particularly productive. Um, so I'm not saying every company should do what we do. But when you can get to the scale and the maturity level that we're at, it is, is a bonus. Um, you know, I go home. I have dinner with my wife and kids. I have young kids. Um, and then, you know, after my kids go to bed at 8 o'clock, I'm back online doing stuff. And a lot of my team is as well. But it kind of 
we have a, I would say, a fairly family-friendly environment. That's part of our culture. That's kind of part of the people we attract. We don't have, you know, kids staying up all night playing video games and sleeping in our, in our conference rooms M most of the time. There's a few occasions. But <laughs> when we were talking before, back in the hiring, when we were talking before, you said, you know, I'm not a believer in interviews. Yeah, I mean, you have to do them because you have to get a, some sense of the person, um, but I think interviews create a lot more false positives than anything else. And so, um, so when I started at SurveyMonkey, I was literally the only person here. We had 12 people in Portland, most of whom were customer support. So I had to hire basically the entire team, and I did all the hiring because there was there was no one else to do it basically. And um, I interviewed a lot of people, um, and I found that. Um, the places where I made mistakes were places where um, I didn't have a good reference. It wasn't somebody either I knew or a friend of a friend or whatever. Those were kind of the mistake areas. And not to say you can't make mistakes there as well, but um, uh, interviews can lead you to some some bad decisions um, versus sort of you know getting a direct referral um, often tends to be much more highly correlated with success on the hiring side. And, and how do you think about sort of balancing sort of athletes, you know, people who are sort of the best at a specific skill set versus bringing in generalists? And do, do you structure your org in such a way that there can sort of be harmony or there's sort of like planned harmony between the two? Yeah, you have to try to work at this, and it sort of depends what scale you're at and what size. I think when you're really early, like, there's this real need, like, wow, I don't know anything about sales. I've got to hire a great sales guy who knows about sales. And, and I think that is true. Like, so you need, you need this mixture of the two, um, but some of the worst mistakes in hiring I've ever made are hiring someone who looked like they had great experience but just, you know, didn't fit with the culture, didn't, couldn't deliver on what their experience was, didn't translate to the new business. Like, a lot of times experience can cause problems. Um, and then there's the people who don't have any experience but are just really smart and talented and motivated. And when you get those people right, you know, they're your homegrown talent, if you will. Those are your you know, farm team. Um, those people, um, are, you know, for the most part, are the, the best people long-term inside the company. They're the carriers of the culture. They grew up there. You took a chance on them. They've kind of learned how to be in a business. So we, we create spots where we can hire people, you know, into finance, um, into business development, into product. We can bring in really smart, talented people and train them. And so, you know, we have a woman now who came in as a financial analyst, and she decided she... Um, wants to be an engineer. So we're sending her to, to classes to be an engineer. Great. She's super talented, really smart, had never thought about coding before she joined us, right? So I don't know if she's going to be a great engineer, but if she does, she's going to be incredibly loyal to us. She's going to have the kind of the company sort of took care of her and did the right things for her. So, but it's hard when you're in a, in a small startup to say, wow, I'm going to just hire this smart kid out of a investment bank or consulting yeah. or something like that. They don't know anything. So yeah. it's, you got to have a mix. So we, we've talked a lot about sort of finding the team, hiring the team, and bringing them on board. Once they are on board and you, you, you're, you're now sort of managing them, how do you balance sort of the long-term goals of the business versus the more short-term goals? Yeah, I think this is, this is the kind of trade-offs you're making, and I think if you're running the company, this is the hardest thing you have to do all the time, is sort of thinking about, you know, sort of what is the strategy, and then how do you allocate resources and make those tough choices, you know, and I think it's, it's oftentimes very easy to sort of say, I'm going to do what's immediate instead of what's important, and what's important is what you said you're going to do, but the immediate sort of drags you in, and how do you balance, you know, cash flow and investment versus profitability and you know those things wax and wane people are like oh you've got to be profitable right away no 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 you got to spend as much money as you can to acquire customers like i think you got to ignore all that outside noise first of all do you employ okrs or any sort of methodology like that or is it more um we do have a version of that but i think it's really 
um, just critical people understand sort of, you know, here's, here's what we're trying to do this quarter, yep. right? And we have kind of quarterly goals. And here's what we're trying to do for the year, and here's what we're trying to do long term. And if what you're doing doesn't fit in any of those three buckets, you shouldn't be doing it. Yeah. And, and so it's kind of always a good check to sort of see, you know, which of those things. And then we do, I would say that the most important thing is kind of, uh, you know, accountability, right? We have a board meeting every quarter. We, we go, we, at the beginning of the quarter, we say, here's what we're going to do this quarter. And at the end of the quarter, we say, did we do it or not? Right? And at the end of the year, we say, did we do it or not? And, and we do pretty well, you know, we, we missed some things, we're late on um, development, um, <laughs> as everyone is. Um, but, um, but I think that accountability is the most critical part of the yeah. process. But you've got to push people in the upfront part, because if they think, wow, I'm going to be, you know, fired if I don't hit everything, then people will, will dramatically constrain what they're going to try to do. So you've got to be able to push people on what they can do. And then, you know, not make it like failure if you didn't get everything. We don't, we're not looking for 100%. We're looking for 90. Is, um, is your sort of managing towards sort of the quarterly goals, the annual goals, or you, do you meet with your team sort of on a, like, do you have a weekly staff meeting? So I'm um, probably more anti-meeting than most people in my job, and it's just my nature. I, I'm not saying meetings are bad for everybody, but I'm kind of... Which is a remarkable statement from someone who spent so much time at Yahoo. Well, that was <laughs> a little bit of my reaction. Um, uh, I like to just sort of have quick hallway conversations. Um, someone comes by my desk and asks me a question. I try to make sure I've got actually a few hours free in a day where people can just come find me or I can go find them. So um, I don't have regularly scheduled one-on-ones with any of my direct reports. They know they can come get time with me, but I don't, but I don't, I don't do meetings just to do meetings. And so I only have um, two and a half regularly scheduled meetings a week. I have a staff meeting. I have a meeting where we kind of go through all of our um, product testing, and I go through kind of our sort of marketing, customer acquisition stuff, because that's stuff we're literally tuning day by day, week by week, and so I need to sort of see, and it, it, it impacts a lot of things, so those things. But everything else is sort of, people come to me and say, hey, I need your help with this. Um, and not to say other people don't do one-on-ones and those sort of things, but I've set up my organization in a way, and I think this is probably the most relevant for everybody here, is like, think about what you're good at, think about what you're not good at. And then find a way to do more of what you're good at and less of what you're not good at, and find other people, because you're the CEO, we're gonna do more of the stuff you're not good at and make sure that that's their strength. So in sort of putting that senior team around you, the real critical thing is understanding your strengths and weaknesses and then finding other people who balance you. And so I'm not a process person. I know process is important, but it's not my thing. I don't like it that much, I'm, uh, but I know we need it. So I hire people who are actually around me who are good at it and, and things seem to work pretty well in that manner. Um, but I think there's a, I tend to be kind of, you know, the external person, right? So I've got people who are really good at the internal side. So it, thinking about what you're good at and then what, what, what you're not good at and then getting the people around you to fill in those gaps is really important. And I think, you know, one last question from me and then I, I want to get some questions from the audience because I think we've held, we've held back on that so far today. But uh, with, with the lighter approach to a staff meeting, how do you make sure that sort of your head of engineering is communicating with your head of product, is communicating with your head of marketing? Um, it, it's the most critical thing we have is that that sort of, that dynamic among those teams works really well. And so the staff meeting is actually sort of stuff that we just need to talk about as a group, but it's not about the day-to-day -day interaction. Those things are happening all the time. And to the degree they're not, boy, we're gonna get everyone in a room and sort that out and figure it out. So I'm very much, you know, uh, the last speaker talked about teams. I mean, it, the team needs to work. And if the team's not working, we're gonna sort it out and we're gonna, you know, we're gonna find a way to make it work or we're gonna actually make changes on the teams. And that's not just my senior team, but all the teams down below. We're gonna make changes to make that team dynamic work. So the staff meeting, there's not a whole lot of information in the staff meeting that gets that isn't already available and people don't know all those things. It's more kind of for group discussion. Um, and, uh, and, and so we try to have topics that we talk about in that meeting, but it's not about, 
how do I get engineering to do more with sales, marketing, et cetera? That's just not, that's not what that is. They, they gotta be doing that as part of their just regular job. Okay. Dave, thank you for, uh, on that happy note, <laughs> Dave. <laughs> thank you very much. <laughs>